Roll, please. Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Morrissey. Here. Mr. Powers. Here. Mr. Lind, Mr. Amos. Here. Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Welper. Here. Mo motion to approve the agenda as proposed. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the agenda today. Is there any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion uh, passes. Today we're here to uh, get an update on the consent decree with uh, Steve Holmbrecher. So take it away, Steve. Thanks, Ron. Um, going to try to go through this quickly. We've got 45 minutes. We've got a lot to try to share with everybody. So... I'm going to get right into it. Uh, I thank you. I'm not only presenting by myself. I've got uh, John LaPointe assisting me as we talk about this. Uh, he's been heavily involved in this from the, the point when he was sitting in my current chair to helping put together the master plan. So his, as well as uh, AECOM's uh, assistance, has been gratefully uh, noted. Uh, also, we have... Uh, uh, Laura Wolf in the audience today. She's been the heart of a lot of the stuff that we've been doing, uh, working on the, the consent decree related stuff. So thank everybody for their input as we move forward. I decided when I prepared for this, there's been several times somebody has said, or I've heard things that I don't know anything about the consent decree. How did we get where we go? So I'm going to start, and this was good for me as well because I wasn't here at the time, to look back a little bit and try to figure out how did we get where we are today. Essentially, what I found out is that, kind of in a way, the city of Waterloo was kind of double teamed by the uh, United States of America and the state of Iowa. To that point, kind of figure out, well, there must have been some kind of starting point. So basically, back in November of 2010, uh, an EPA representative came and did an extensive collection system inspection of our system. So what was the outcome of that? Well, it was quite the tug of war as I looked at it. EPA basically said these things. The city said the city failed to provide collection system physical characteristics, report basement backups, footage of lines cleaned and televised. These are things we failed to do. Not, a, not appropriate funding to administer and maintain our sanitary sewer system. Act and take necessary measures to address infiltration inflow. Maintain physical lift station structures. Provide alternate lift station power backup. Provide lift station alarm system. Evaluate collection system hydraulic loading. And develop written procedures for administering the collection system. What did we say in response to that? We were not aware that basement backups counted as SSOs or sanitary sewer overflows. We had info on lines televised and clean from previous years. We had spent funding, just needed to, I, needed to identify the projects. We had identified problem areas and will identify needed improvements. We had identified potential INI footing drains but needed policy changes. We agreed that the lift stations needed upgrading, questioned the structural integrity part. We had portable pumps for lift station emergency operations. We stated that each lift station had alarms. We're in the process of including with our SCADA, which is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, and it explained that the private sources of INI footing drains we were working on that as well as other sources. So what was the result? From 2010 when this was made to 2013, Waterloo was evidently on EPA's radar. We still continue to have a lot of INI infiltration inflow and bypasses reported. From 2013 uh, to the consent decree, it isn't like we didn't do anything. We hired a CMOM specialist, hired a CMOM technician. We developed a fog ordinance and hired a fog inspector. We developed a footing drain program and hired an inspector. We incorporated sanitary sewer maps into our GIS database. We updated our SSO reporting and expanded TV and cleaning program. Also during this time period from 2013, uh, the discussions began. EPA was reading their consent decree, which was finalized in 2015. On behalf of the city, we hired an attorney by the name of John Hall, who was uh, still influential in helping us evaluate our options uh, to this day with this consent decree as we move forward. In the end, though, the city agreed to sign the consent decree. What happened, though, is we did receive a $270,000, $72,000 penalty. However, half of that, or $136,000, which was to go to the state, was basically deferred as long as we did an environmental benefit beneficial reuse project. Here's some quick things from the consent decree looking back. It was issued in October 26, 2015. 
As I stated, that civil penalty was 272,000 with half of that uh, coming back to the city. Uh, we were required to develop a master plan. We had to do SSO signage, implement a CMOM program, implement a sanitary sewer overflow response plan, collect rainfall flow monitoring for hydraulic modeling, complete condition assessment of the sewer system, develop hydraulic sanitary sewer model, develop city, develop capacity assessment, submit a sanitary sewer system master plan. There were reporting requirements along with this to EPA and IDNR annually, along with some other interim reports on the end of December each year. There were stipulated penalties. There were daily fines for failure to submit timely or complete reports uh, to satisfy remedial requirements. Each SSO or prohibited bypass will be subject to flooding and failure to comply with the reporting requirements. What were some of those penalties? Again, the failure, most of these were in increments of day one through 30, 31 through 60, and greater than 60. You can see. Had we failed to submit timely and complete reports, we would have been fined from $200 to over $600 a day. The remedial requirements, those were much greater. That would be $500 to $2,000 a day from that zero to plus 60 days. Now this is the SSOs and prohibited bypasses. You'll note on here that prior to the master plan, which is to be submitted December 31st, fines were not applicable. But beginning in January, those fines are applicable, and they go through each of the uh, three-year time periods, escalating from $200 a day all the way to $1,000 per day. And again, the reporting requirements were like up above $200 to $600 per day. I'm happy to say that the stat status of the penalty fines, now again, we did have to pay the half of the 172 or the 136, that was paid. But to date, we have met all the reporting requirements and paid no fines. We are on target to meet the 2017 required deadlines. And as I indicated earlier, beginning in 2018, we'll be subject to fines for SSOs, now mind you, with exceptions for excessive rains and flood levels in Black Hawk Creek or the Cedar River. Our overall goal, goal is, as we've taken a look at this, is to reduce the system I, &I infiltration inflow and prevent SSOs. Initially, we took two paths of this, uh, the CIPP lining process and the footing drain program. Talking a little bit about the footing drain program, that was adopted in October 27, 2014. Again, remember, prior to the consent decree being issued, it was effective January 1, 2015. In the initial two, we were through the initial two years, and now it's been extended to 2017. Presently, and for the last two construction years, we've had uh, <clears throat> of these um, of drains, we've had flow monitors on 20, about 20 homes to try to get an idea how much the flow is. I'm going to talk about the special flow test in the bottom right there a little bit more, so I won't get into that. To give you an example of what happens with excessive I, &I through the footing drains, you can kind of see where that's circled on the right picture there. This is the amount of clear water that a very active footing drain can be pumping or allowing, not pumping, but allowing the water to flow directly into the uh, sanitary sewer system. Through September of 2017, there were approximately, when we started, 4,000 homes. We had almost 3,700 of those were considered compliant, and almost 2,400 had been disconnected. This is an example of some of the flow monitoring we've had, and this goes back through April of 2016 all the way up through the most recent data we got in October. So you can see as the million gallons we estimated were reduced, the yellow is the inches of precipitation, and the blue is the river height. The river height has a little bit to do with it, but you can tell readily every time that we got a heavy rain, or moderately heavy rain, now these are monthly figures, that the flow in the, uh, as you would expect, the flows in the uh, flow meters coming off the footing drains greatly increased. We look back at June when we had uh, the million gallons was one of the highest months of the time we've had recorded. That spiked when we had a, a, a heavy set of rainfall that month. Conversely, if you look out till August, September of this year, where basically the yellow line goes down to next to nothing, the footing drains basically stopped pumping or allowing water to come in. I think out of the 20, only three of them registered any flow. The rains came back up again late September, October, and you can see right along with it, so did the flow from the footing drain program. Here's an example of the August, 
August peak rains of the, of the footing drains. It's kind of tough. We didn't get readings every day for the first, it's like through August 1st through the 5th. And then we took a rain, uh, took a reading. And during that time period, again, this was over four days, but there on the 4th, 5th, we had uh, almost 1.6 inches of rain. During that time period, those four days, we picked five meters, kind of randomly, some low, some high, and they averaged a total of 306 gallons per day. During that next seven day period, basically there was no rain, the red line on the bottom, no rain. And the flow dropped in half, roughly. Now all of a sudden we did have one day where on the 11th and 12th we were able to take meter readings. And that meter reading for that one day, mind you, is probably equally back on that earlier set, but we only had it averaged over four days. As soon as we got the rain, you can see basically the gallons per day went all the way from 155 for those previous seven days all the way up to that one day to 936 gallons per day. So the point I'm saying is the footing drains really pump when it rains a lot and the ground is saturated, it pumps a lot of water. It allows a lot of water to go into the system, which also contributes to our SSOs. It's during our peak time, which, caught, which is when we have problems, when we're gonna be subject to it. So the footing drain has been effective. Kind of more summarizing, here's that 4,000 households again. Uh, one of the things the city did when they adopted this program was to pay up to $2,000 per household disconnected. In stats I received back in, I think, late September, early October, uh, we had spent a little over $250,000 for inspection fees, and we'd paid out almost $4.7 million for the disconnection program. And those are the numbers basically from October of 16. You can see they're going up. This actually kind of shows that I've actually been able to add the October data in there, and you can see the red line is basically those in compliance. Some of them didn't need to do anything. The ones in blue are the ones that did implement a separate uh, footing drain with putting in a sump and pumping it outside and not allowing it to go into the sanitary sewer system. This map illustrates through September. Again, I'm sorry, some of them are October and September. All these little areas in red are areas and households basically that have been determined to be in compliance. And as you can expect, there's 3,700 out of 4,000, the area should be pretty red. As we've moved on with the program, one of the things that uh, I met with Bob Liskow, the footing drain inspector right now, and he basically said he was starting, there was about at the time 350. So he's going around to those 350 and putting door hangers on, reminding them that they need to get this inspection done before the end of the year. So what is the status of the footing program, drain program? Uh, again, it, it originally required compliance. It does require compliance by the end of this year. That ordinance was passed in 14. There was another ordinance in, in, eight, in August of 16 that basically extended it for one more calendar year. The way the original ordinance was written and not changed by the, re, the second ordinance, those in non-compliant are subject to a $50 per month penalty fee. As I said, in October, Bob put out the door hangers. So where's the program going from here? I mean, we've got to make some decisions. Are we going to turn around and find those others that, that aren't in compliance? Are we going to extend the program a little longer? Uh, I can say, and hopefully I think when you looked at the data, it does prove that there's a, it's effectively removing the peak flows. It is, the way it's been orchestrated, a very expensive program. Uh, and it does... And we need to probably, I think if we're going to continue it, my recommendation would be to possibly continue it at a lower city contribution. That may be a tough pill to, to, to handle. And, you know, the previous set of people were allowed to get $2,000 and now maybe you set it back to 1000 to 1500 bucks. You know, that's something that, that would, would probably take some political will if we continue in that. Um, options for possible continues. I think one of the things to look at would be to target the high flow households. I can honestly tell by listening to mine, I'm not in service area 15 or 16, but when there's high ground water and we've had some rain, I can hear mine running into the sanitary sewer system. And during August, I couldn't hear it, it wasn't running. So there may be a way we could target those that have higher flows. One of the things we found when you looked at the overall data is that some people might average 30 gallons a day while others were averaging two, 3,000 gallons a day. So it really didn't pay the, the, the benefit out of it wasn't necessarily on the ones that had low flow, but the ones that do have high flow, you remove a lot of peak flow, which will again contribute to uh, SSOs. Another possibility what we call the point of sale, when people sell their house, that may be another way. Some communities are doing it that way. When you sell your house, you make it a requirement that you have your footing drain evaluated, and if it's 
if it is an issue and they're in there, then you require the homeowner to uh, pay to have it removed. So enough about that. I did, I did spend a lot of time on the footing drain program, but there are some immediate things, again, we have to talk about in the very, very near upcoming future. I'm not going to talk a lot about the FOG program, but it's been very effective. There are a lot of numbers here, but you probably the easiest one in the upper right part is the amount of prior to the program, how many pounds of grease that were removed. We take the grease out and it goes out to our anaerobic lagoon, and then we keep track of how many pounds were removed. Back in 14, we had under 500,000, up to 870,000 pounds, and right at 1.4 million pounds in 2016. I don't have all of 2017's data. So it has been a very effective program in removing the amount of grease contributed from the, from the restaurants. Now, I remind you, this is only commercial, doesn't take care of residential. We do have a, a video trying to, trying to target the residential users, trying to encourage them to, to not pour their grease down the drain as well. Now, where, where are we at today? We've taken an approach, when we look at this whole thing leading up to this master plan submittal, the city has been the lead agent for the condition assessment. AECON's been responsible for the capacity, port capacity assessment of this. And together, we're putting this information together, and AECON's been preparing a master plan. Just another little bit of information on all this, we did spend a lot of money on equipment through this whole process. A little, back in late 2015, a little over $2 million. So the city has definitely approached this and, and tried to put their best foot forward, and this equipment's been very influential in helping us gather the data and analyze the sewer system. I don't know if you remember, one of the other things ongoing was the uh, sanitary sewer overflow requirements. When we do have, for any of you that might recognize this picture, this was at Letch and Pleasant Valley. When we do have an overflow, we have to put out this sign. You can kind of tell the Kathy, the lady on the right, is actually collecting a sample. We have to test it. We have to, because it's going into this grassy waterway, add chlorine to it. This was happening, I know I came in October or June of 16, I think we had one event, but since then we've not, since the effects have been in full force with the uh, lining program and the um, footing drains, we haven't had any issues since that time at this location. Again, we have the condition and the capacity assessment. Basically, the first year through 16, we were required to do service areas 15 and 16. They're kind of in that northwest part of town. Then. We did submit, we did all, did all the required the capacity assessment report, the condition assessment reports. Those were both submitted by December as required. Now, what we're currently working on and we're prepared to submit is for the rest of the town using our best engineering judgment with these service areas targeted, and that needs to be submitted by the end of December. Just another interesting thing we found that I'm putting in here, the blue is basically the river, river gauge height, and the red is the million gallons per day flow coming in. It's very parallel. <laughs> when, the river, when the river goes up, our flows go up. As you can see, every time the blue goes up, the red goes up. Probably one of the more interesting things was during the flood uh, last year, and we were able to, I wish we could find the source of all this on all these occasions, but we did find, first of all, uh, there were fish coming in the bar screen. We have a screen at the plant, and basically it screens out larger things, and will definitely take out fish. So we started to see fish in the bar screen, when the river went down, we had a manhole on the riverside, and lo and behold, there was a big hole in it, and one of the residual uh, fish was still sitting there sunbathing. So we definitely know where that source is. I wish all the sources along the river were that easy to find. To that extent, when the river was low, we have tried to do some additional televising and taking a look. This is actually on the line coming from the east side of the river over to the west side or where the treatment plant is. We didn't have a lot of time to do this, and it wasn't as successful as we'd hoped, but we, hopefully we can get back to this again. So what has, what has happened so far on the lining and the manhole? We've put a lot of money into those programs. Basically, we have a total of almost 8,000 manholes in the system. A little over 2,500 of those have been inspected, roughly 30, a third of them. Of those 2,500 manholes, uh, there were 600, roughly 25% where no work was needed. Uh, there are 30, a third of those, of uh, roughly 841, have had repairs, and there are still 1,000 that need future work. Just as a quick explanation of what we're doing, we call manhole repair. It's a little difficult to tell, but on the lower left part of that, there was a crack underneath where one of the rings were, where you can kind of see his finger sliding in. They initially came in with a concrete and patched that, and then when they get done and patched it on the right, that's how smooth it looks on the inside. 
This all work, all the work for the CIPP and the manholes have been contracted to the low bidders, always been municipal pipe and tool out of Hudson, and they use a company called Dependable to, to do the manhole rehab. As part of this whole process, again, I said the city was responsible <coughs> for the condition, condition assessment. This is our crews out there. Uh, basically, we have to clean the sewers and then we televise them and we make a condition assessment, which is then turned over to AECOM and they analyze the data and they've been assembling, putting the bid and done the inspection of the, of the CIPP manhole project. <clears throat> this just goes back just a little bit of the sanitary service areas once again, as you can see them. And to let you know with 15 and 16, this is the CIPP lining program. So we have completed a phase one, a phase two, and a phase 3A. What's remaining is phase 3B and 3C. And out of this, we're using this information as part of the master plan and outlining future projects. This is kind of a total of the service area 15. I'm not, there's a lot of data here, but you can see we've, we've inspected all of it and uh, we've lined roughly 31% of it. There is uh, like 470 feet that need to be repaired. What happened to there, we, we have to go back and make spot repairs. So we go back, make those spot repairs, and then we'll reline those areas. They, they weren't in a condition to line at the time. Service area 16, a lot larger area, very similar. We did do all the inspection. In this area, we've lined about 48%, almost 50% of the pipe to date, and we have that other 1,100 that need to be repaired and eventually relined. So what's the steps to this process, just real quick? Uh, when, it, when we turn this over to, again, we've already inspected and determined it needs work done. So municipal pipe and tool, the contractor comes in, they clean the pipe, they cut out any roots if necessary, they identify the active laterals. The laterals are the lines that come from your house and are connected to the sanitary sewer system. They verify the size of the pipe. Then they go back in and they line the pipe. Then they re-televise it, and then they cut out the laterals, and then followed that in the ladder projects, we've been grouting the laterals. There's a little bit more about this, but this is probably one of the more interesting uh, projects we found. This is going across Dry Run Creek. Looks like a simple, some might think that would be a water line. It's actually a sewer line. And interesting, what we found out, as you can see in that circled area, when there was high flow in there, there was uh, water, I hate to say it, but there was water exiting the sewer going into the creek. Interestingly, as I was talking to Ross, he used to live in this area when he, with AECOM. He'd be walking this area, and he kind of sometimes smelled sewage. He thinks he now knows where it came from. <laughs> On the converse, this is when the pipe is low and there's no flow. Now we're taking water from the creek, and that's going into the sanitary sewer system. This is what it looks like, same pipe when we put the lining in. You can tell that there's gonna be no flow going in or no flow going out. This is what we're attempting to accomplish. This helps with the integrity of the pipe, the structural integrity, and also reduces the I and I. This is another one. This is like that one before with the footing drain. This kind of just shows the pre and the post of this area. If you take a look at that lower circle in red, you can see all the water coming in. If you look at the same pipe, one was done 1214, one was done 1221 that flow is still coming in, but to a much lesser amount. Now again, after lining, each of the laterals have to be gone and cut out. One of the things we've done in the latter stages is we have started grouting that so we can try to reduce that extra water coming in. This is a little tough to tell, but you can kind of see in the, the up there, uh, the circle is probably should be around, there's kind of a yellowish piece of pipe. That is inserted into the lateral, and then it's tied off on each side of the lateral, and then they put this pressurized grout that you can kind of see on the right picture over there, and it gels, it sets up, it's two resin components, it gels and then stops the flow of the surface coming in at that lateral and the, the uh, sewer, sanitary sewer connection. What have we spent so far to date on the projects? Well, the first CIPP lining project, it was almost 770. The second one, which we just completed, was a little over 1.7. Well, we completed that last year. And the one we are just in the process of completing, the first phase of it is almost 1.6 million. In total for the CIPP lining, we spent a little over $4 million. We talked about the environmental beneficial reuse project. Those of you might see it, this is the alley between the brown bottle on the, I guess that would be the south half, the side closest to 6th Street. Uh, that is basically lined with this pervious pipe. We had two ways to do it. Sometimes they have pervious con, pervi permeable pavers you put in where the water pours through. We use the blocks with the, with the cracks in them. 
And this is where we applied the $136,000 from the state to, our, to put in and do this project. One of the things outstanding is the consent decree required us to get a vacuum truck. We've taken a look at that and we've, uh, we, we're, at this time we're recommending we're going to try to get out of purchasing the vac truck component. It's probably about $7,500. Uh, there are other ways we can perform water tests on a regular basis to see if the efficiency is still there, which we are going to continue to do. We may also contract it out, but eventually we're going to be working with the street department. They have a special street sweeper that will help clean this because it really doesn't make sense right now to spend a lot of money on half a block, but it is a requirement of the consent decree. So now we total all the various things that I've told you on the cost per day. The equipment I told you is a little over $2 million. The C the CIPP projects, almost 4.1. The footing drain uh, was around 4.7. The environmental, the permeable pavement project, we got 136. There have been some other complications like a lot of projects. It's closer to 180,000. We spent a total of about $11 million so far on the various things that we've done to try to reduce I&I. From all this, like I said, we've been doing the concession assessment and AECOM's been working on the capacity assessment from that, we're putting together the master plan, which is all due at the end of this year. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to John, who's going to talk a little bit more about what he's putting together for this master plan. Pretty good. Thank you, Steve. So first, I'd like to thank the City of Waterloo for the opportunity to work on this important master plan and capacity assessment to be able to continue uh, to be involved with the city has been a great pleasure. I also want to thank all the staff from uh, waste management, city engineering, uh, Mayor Hart's office, uh, Michelle Wiedner, everybody for, for helping um, as I've continued to be able to work on this uh, consent decree requirements. Um, like to, on behalf of AECOM, thank you and, and uh, thank the support I get from Doug Chandol and Ross Hillsman um, here in the Waterloo office. So, um, Waterloo's consent decree requirements. So you were required to do a hydraulic model, modeling of your sanitary sewer system. That was all done. Well, let me walk through the requirements and we'll go back to each one. Do the hydraulic model, uh, do a condition assessment that Steve just mentioned that was done by the Waste Management Sanitary District staff do a capacity assessment, and then do a master plan that talks about improvements for the next 15 years. So the hydraulic model, the hydraulic model, uh, the field work on that began in 2015. AECOM uh, uh, staff were out and putting flow monitoring equipment um, in the system. Um, they did that modeling and in, in, they completed the actual running of the model, the uh, computer modeling in 2016 and submitted, uh, they had to initially, initially submit that in August of 2016 to the state and federal um, agencies. Uh, that model was used to identify, of course, where you've got excessive infiltration and inflow and evaluate the capacity of the sanitary sewer system uh, and pumping systems. And the condition assessment, uh, again, like Steve said, this was done by his staff looking, uh, using uh, te the televising equipment they had mostly, uh, their staff going out. Um, Laura back here helping coordinate things uh, at the sanitary district with uh, evaluation of the, of the pumping stations and force means. Um, we also identified, and, and uh, again, great assistance from Eric Thorson and his staff, identified storm sewer cross connections uh, to the sanitary connected to the sanitary sewer system. Um, this town has a lot of those and uh, um, we were able to identify and document those. The capacity assessment, it identified existing sanitary sewer system bottlenecks and then we were also required by the consent decree to uh, evaluate what would happen to this system under uh, uh, the next, out, out, looking outward to the next 20 years to evaluate uh, growth for population, industry and just uh, filling in of undeveloped areas. And then the master plan improvements. Uh, this is putting together preliminary design cost estimates and time frames for uh, improvements to, uh, of course, eliminate um, sanitary sewer system overflows, bypasses, and um, 
building backups. So the good news, I got, I got to compliment the city of Waterloo. The good news on all of this is that you've already been doing a lot of work. Uh, you didn't wait for the master plan to be written. The way that the consent decree had it all set up was you were to write a master plan in uh, 2017 to be completed by the end of 2017. And the way it was written is that at the end of doing that master plan, you would have evaluated things that you could do. And then starting in 2018, you would begin doing them. Well, you are already several years into doing foundation during removal um, removals program that has taken all this water off that Steve talked about, taking it off the system. You are already several years into doing cured in place pipe program to uh, eliminate infiltration and inflow into your sanitary sewers and, and, and also just restore the condition of aging infrastructure. Um, you are already doing projects to eliminate cross connections, the city engineering uh, on their um, street reconstruction projects, in particular, the one on Fletcher Drive and um, uh, Wellington Street have been uh, in areas where storm sewers have been eliminated from the sanitary sewer. So you have already been doing a lot of these things, so compliment the city on being way ahead of where you could have been if you would have just said, well, we're not going to do anything until we get this master plan written. So some of the condition-related improvements, the mentioning here, well, and I mentioned CIPP lining, but also a lot of manhole rehabilitations. Steve showed you pictures there. Um, you've got some lift station work has been done, a lot more needs to be done. And uh, we're looking at doing additional studies on the interceptors, the east side and west side interceptors to evaluate them before we uh, decide exactly what needs to be done there. Again, on the capacity related improvements, you've already been doing a foundation drains and removal program. You've already designed a, a project called Dry Run Creek Lift Station and Interceptor, which is designed to relieve pressure on the 9th Street corridor. That Dry Run Creek shot that Steve showed you is in that area. There's a, um, uh, there's a benefit to uh, reducing um, bypasses in that area because of the Dry Run Creek project. You've got the Northwest Interceptor project, which would eliminate the Hackett Lift Station. That's already under design and planning. Uh, uh, plan for construction in the near future. Uh, there's a project called the Titus uh, lift station, which is out by Midland Street, uh, which has already been modeled by AECOM to determine what improvements need to be done there to fix your uh, infrastructure in that neighborhood. Uh, storm sewer cross connection removal projects. I mentioned that a lot of storm sewers have already, storm sewer intakes have already been taken off of the sanitary sewer. And uh, you've already done some smoke testing out in the south. Uh, uh, southeast corner, no, yeah, southeast corner, southwest, southwest corner of the, sorry, southwest corner of the city where uh, they did smoke testing and identified a lot of uh, uh, areas where clear water is entering the system. Okay, so let's get down to the, the dollars and cents. Uh, this is a really a good news uh, for the city because what we have come up with AECOM, we've been working on this uh, with uh, city staff in collaboration here, and we have come up with the uh, master plan for improvements, a draft of which Steve just handed out. And the, and the really good news is that when, when we did the capacity assessment, it was determined that there really wasn't any surprises there. The bottlenecks that were in your system were already well known to everyone. Things like the Northwest Interceptor with Hackett and the Titus Lift Station, Dry Run Creek, and those are things you are already working on. Uh, the foundation, uh, Area 15 and 16, where you're putting in, you're removing the foundation drains, already working on that. So uh, you have already spent millions of dollars on improvements that would have showed up in this master plan if you already hadn't been doing them over the last three or four years. So kudos to the city where you're doing things that other cities are dragging their feet on as far as when other, when they talk about across the United States aging infrastructure and that we need to address it, you guys are doing it. But here's the, you know, here's the, the news about the, the money, is that as the spreadsheet shows there, what we're saying, uh, AECOM's recommendation, the way that the report comes out, and not just our recommendation, but we've visited with uh, John Hall, your uh, attorney that specializes in these projects. Uh, we visited with Mayor Hart and, and Michelle. And, 
the, where, where we see it is that you have a certain number of improvements that need to be done that we feel are necessary to meet the uh, requirements of the consent decree. And those uh, total up to around uh, $17.9 million worth and would probably likely be done over the next uh, three years, end, ending up in, in about 2020. And many of those, like I said before, though, you already are doing or planning on doing. Um, then you also have a rather large number of uh, do dollar amount there for projects which are needed that would be ongoing to keep you in compliance with uh, the requirements of the consent decree that are part of your long-term CMOM program, CMOM standing for Capacity Management, Operation, and Maintenance. So that's a program that you're required to do by the consent decree to keep it up to date, and uh, it includes ongoing uh, lining of, of leaky pipes, um, continuation of elimination of cross connections, storm sewers cross connection, all of these things out there that we have identified in your uh, master plan uh, need to, do, to be done. For a total investment in the infrastructure over the 15 year life of the, of the consent decree of about 82 million. So back to Steve for a little bit about uh, which bucket things are put in. Thanks, John. I think if you'll notice that on those various projects, there are some that are in red, some that are in yellow. Uh, so basically, like John said, when we took a look at this, we have put it up into the two buckets. The, C the consent decree bucket, which is the bucket in red, which is almost 18 million, as John talked about, and then the other 60, almost 65 million in what we call the, the CMOM bucket. So what does that mean exactly? Uh, these are projects that when we took a look to comply with the consent decree that are due to the lack of adequate capacity or caused by deficiencies in our operation and maintenance program. So these projects are generally underway, like John said, the Dry Run Creek projects, the capital improvements, the CIPP phase three, B and C, we're through all the way through 3A, the Northwest Interceptor and the decommissioning of the Hackett Street lift station, the Titus, the Midless lift station and the Force Main, and the footing drain removal program. And the good news, I think when we take a look at this, we could be near the finish line, possibly in the next three to five years of completing this portion of the projects. So there is a part of the consent decree that says, uh, if the city can demonstrate, well, let's go, yeah, if we can demonstrate that for one year that the SSOs, the building backups and the prohibitive bypasses caused by, were, were, that previously were caused by a lack of added capacity or deficiency in the O&M, excuse me, have been eliminated, then we can go ahead with this, with the, with the submittal of the demonstration for the one year and possibly work our way out of the consent decree. It's kind of worded in this way, that one first and the other one, but basically it says, the other part of it says, if we conclude our improvements that we have made to eliminate, which are all the ones in this red bucket, and we've got those all scheduled through the first three year period of around 2020, then we may submit for a request for termination of the consent decree, which I think the biggest picture of that, if we can accomplish it, will be those fines out there in those latter years that can get to $1,000 a day. But there's work ahead of us. Uh, so what does, in thinking about this, what did that really mean? Potentially as early as three to five years, we could get to a position to get out from underneath the requirements of the consent degree. That means we'd have to have our stuff done and we have that one year demonstration project. So I think that could be a very big thing. I know that was one of the key issues when, when I was looking at this job that Mayor Hart said, if we can, any way we can get out of this early, let's try to make sure we put things in place so that can be done. So. This is a slide when I presented it to you a year ago, I've reissued it, and I think it's important. John talked about it. You know, by making the improvements that we've made here in the city of Waterloo, I really do think that we're ahead of the game. And we spent a lot of money, 11 million in that, in this example, 10 million. But if we continue to wait like other cities are doing, we all know the cost of everything's escalating. We're gonna more than likely, the stuff that we've done for that 11 million is gonna be well over 15, should we try to do it in the future years down the road. So while it is expensive, it is something that needed to be done. It has had an impact on the system, and I would like to think it's money well spent. I'm just going to caution you as we keep moving forward, you know, the, the heavy deadlines of submitting things with a master plan are done at the end of this year. But I feel in this whole program, we've got to keep the, what I'm calling the pedal to the metal. And that means in this CMOM bucket. You remember the other $65 million that, that we talked about? These are projects that are required to maintain the capacity within the system and the O&M program to prevent 
continued incurrence of the SSOs, the building backups, and prohibited bypasses. So we don't want to forget. We can't forget that. And basically what we've done with this whole thing is there's a 15-year period. The majority of those other projects are the remaining outlying 15 years. So in conclusion with all this, where are we at? We have, as we talked about earlier, we have paid half of the original fine of that $272,000. We're putting the other half toward the environmental beneficial project. We have met all the reporting requirements. We have paid no more penalty, no more penalty fines other than that one. Efforts to date have reduced the system INI and the associated SSOs. We do need to decide the future of the footing drain program. And we, are and we are scheduled to submit the final documents as required by the end of this year. By doing all this and putting these programs, we think we are possibly positioning the city to be able to request termination of the consent decree. And in the end, we need to remember we have to continue to maintain a proactive CMOM program to facilitate the ongoing compliance. And with that, questions. I think we actually, we threw a lot at you, and I think we're pretty close to the time frame. So. That won't get you out of taking questions. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I tried to get John to talk longer. Council, you got any, any questions? Pretty meaty presentation. And... Steve. Yes. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, Back on page 12, you, the status of footing drain program, you had um, talked about, as far as the option for continuing that uh, outside of 1516 was uh, continue high, only for high flow households. How do you go about determining that without additional cost? Well, a couple of things that could be possible. If you remember in the slide that basically showed the high flow coming out, I have a feeling during high flow conditions, if they were to televise in front of my house <laughs> and I can hear it running inside, I'm sure we're going to see the clear water running in outside. But that has to be done. That is, that is one potential way. The other way is just to have it inspected. Again, the point of sale is another thing. Have a, a contractor come in. I think actually there's somebody on the radio now advertising to come in and do a free inspection for those areas in this district, one or service area 15 and 16, to come in and inspect it and let you know if you're in compliance or you're not. But at some point, it'd be nice to, and I think we do need to target like the higher ones. If it's a low flow and you're not seeing that stuff, I'm not sure we should be spending, I would recommend, we're getting a better, if this is the right appropriate term, a better bang for the buck, taking the ones that are higher flow, the ones that like in that time period, we're seeing several thousand gallons a day than the ones that we're getting like 30, 30, 30 gallons a day. Have you already determined that? We have not. And we do have some meetings citywide internally to figure out where we're going. Again, one of the important decisions of this is, theoretically, according to the ordinance, if those that aren't in compliance, by December 31st, they're subject to a $50 per month penalty fee. And I, I don't think any of us kind of want to get to that point. We'd rather have everybody be compliant, or you may need to extend the deadline one more time. But And you said there was only like 400 and some that were... Well, last told, town I heard was 350, and I assume with the efforts that we've had putting the door hangers, that number is possibly below 300. But that's a that's an extremely good program when you start with 4,000 and you've probably got 37, 30, 30 800 of them already in compliance. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, Steve, my house was built in 21, and I'm, I'm not hooked up to the uh, storm sewer at all. Uh, any idea what houses would be still left that, are, that could be hooked up to the system? I, I personally, that would probably be something we'd be getting a better answer. If you, rec if you, if you recollect backwards, actually the building code uh, department was actually the one that kind of started this program. They probably have a lot better recollection of the, the plumbing and the systems and the time periods when things were like that and when footing drains. But it's not, it's pretty typical. I think my house was built in the late 60s, so people just, I mean, it was a common practice, right, Lynn? Just take the water, it's already going, you don't have to put any sumps and just drain it into the sanitary sewer system. But it does cause problems with the peak flows, which is the times when we're gonna have the SSOs, especially in those high groundwater areas where, 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 it, where there's a lot of it. So would you say that the older homes probably are not hooked up to the system? It's more, I would say it's the older than, homes probably have their footing drains. Hopefully, even back in that age, they might have taken roof drains and, you right. know, the roof drains and allowed those to go down in there as well. Okay, thanks. All right.
Any other questions for Steve? I got a question on the fog portion of it. I know that we've got a lot of restaurants that have been in compliant when they're being reinspected, and and is there a policy that we could look at so that a com very compliant restaurant would not have to be reinspected as often, um, at, for like a period of time, and then reinspect and then find afterwards if they're not staying in compliance. I would like to think that's the case, but my life experience and human nature tells me if you know someone's not coming or not checking on you, you'll probably let the program slide. And the other thing I know in my discussions with Bob, the person that's doing it, there's a lot of personnel changeovers. Mm -hmm. And while you may be doing it at your restaurant today, you <coughs> may not be there and all of a sudden the owner, Pat, says, hey, Steve, you're in charge of it. I don't really think about it. You know, so it, it is a good reminder and has been very effective uh, at, at getting things done. We, we are contemplating trying to send out some kind of a minimal survey to those people to get a little bit of feedback. I don't know if that's anything council would like. That's something we've kind of had in motion, but we haven't, with everything else, haven't pulled the trigger on that. And then the next question would be, we're pumping water out of the basement, basically, out of that, and pu pushing it out into the yards. And now the yards are flooded. Is there a way that we could consider uh, running pipe that they could plug into to take it to the storm sewer rather than sanitary sewer outside the in, house? In some cases, we have that in a limited fashion. Eric's program, when they reconstruct a the street, is putting such a pipe in place. but. That's not going to get to everywhere in town. Right. And you are correct. Sometimes we correct the problem at my house, but create a problem either outside my <laughs> house or it may flow into your home or your backyard and create a problem. Right. And there's a lot of that going on in the valley. Hughes Drive, Valley Drive, those. And those some valleys. of it, they still continue in the winter months, and then you end up ice in the street. It, it, is, right. the, it, is, it is accomplishing a lot from the sanitary sewer side. But I mean, ideally, when, when cities put this type of program together, they put some kind of a drain that, and there aren't always storm drains everywhere to, once you put it in a pipe out there, it's got to connect to something to get it to like some creek or, or waterway. Well, I think there's some residents we should be able to try to help out by getting it away from their yards and into the storm sewer. Because um, it's a problem in certain areas of town. So we're pumping it out into the yard, creating another problem down the road. I can't argue with you. Well, just All so right. it's in the policy minds. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, all of you put a lot of work into this. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. So thanks for all the work that's being done as well. So thank you. Thank you for all your assistance. All right. Um, we now have a fireworks discussion, and Kelly. All right. Um, so I have on the work session a copy of the ordinance that I put together for fireworks, and this is on the regular session agenda as well. Um, the ordinance includes the recommendation of the Public Safety Committee to allow the usage of fireworks on July 4th only of each year from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, the bulk of, I guess, what's been kind of discussed in towns throughout the state since this law came into effect is what to do about the usage. The sales portion of the um, fireworks law that the state passed still has to remain untouched, but cities do have the ability to impose limitations on the usage of fireworks within their individual communities. Um, Cedar Falls right now has passed the first reading of an ordinance banning fireworks while our neighbor on the other side, Evansdale, is allowing the usage of fireworks for five days. Um, so really at this point, moving forward, it's up to council to determine, do you want to allow the usage of fireworks as is outlined um, in this ordinance now, or do you want to continue to have further discussions about allowing usage for different times within the city? Mr. Amos. Mr. Mayor, um, once again, I don't feel that a complete ban would be justified from a standpoint of with the citizens having the ability to go out and buy fireworks. So for me, if 
there is some window to where they can use fire, fireworks, even though it is a short window, I think that that would be the way to go as opposed to a total ban. So are you like the four to uh, six to 10, or do you like the five days, or what? For me, actually, somewhere in between that, but if, if, if it has to be the four hours, so be it. But if, for me, it's just a matter of I don't think a total ban is a direction that we should be going. That's just my personal opinion on it. Um, and just to add to the conversation, too, um, the, since we do have the ordinance on the agenda tonight, if council's wanting to um, play around with the usage periods outside of what we have on the ordinance on the agenda tonight, um, you can make a motion, a motion to amend it, or if you like, we can table it as well another week out to look at this further, too. But the time period that um, we need to make a decision is, is coming up pretty quickly. Um, the next usage date um, comes in at the end of December. So, okay. Mr. So, um, Kelly, number one, we could just, whatever we do tonight or in the next few weeks, deal only with New Year's Eve, and we could push the 4th of July out until next year, correct? Um, we could. Um, I think it would probably be, since the other cities on either side of Waterloo have already dealt with the usage for both 4th of July and New Year's, it would probably be good to just have a decision made since the other cities on either side of us have kind of come to that conclusion as well, for the Zero, most part. Zero Falls hasn't finalized theirs yet, though, right? Too They're in the process of finalizing right. it. So, I mean, that, that could change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear from the public safety because I, I still wrestle with how are you going to enforce this when I think Chief Troke in the past has told us when it was illegal, there were hundreds of violations and there were never any... Uh, fines written but because it was just that's kind of the way we operated so now you know we're going to make it easier to get them but we're going to make it illegal again it seems to me like we're just heading down a, a bad road from your perspective but i'd love to hear what what you folks have to say joel i will captain water police department chief truck apologizes he couldn't make it tonight he's got a family emergency he's tending to um he did send an email and i'll tell you basically he says his position is that they should be allowed on a limited basis several days around the 4th and one or two days around New Year's for limited times, noon to midnight or otherwise. Anything outside that would be a nightmare for the PD to enforce. Uh, I equate it to buying alcohol. If you could buy alcohol in the city and told people not to drink it, how successful would be at enforcing it? Fireworks are very similar. If you can buy fireworks, how do we enforce? The use becomes very problematic, especially when it occurs in private property and people's neighborhoods and yards. We'd almost have to witness it specifically and be able to attach it to someone. So the, so the third and fourth is what he's thinking about? As he said several days around the fourth <clears throat> and one or two days around New Year's Eve is what his email said. Because the, the, the one for New Year's, what's that time frame? That's just like, December 10th. That like one? No, it's December 10th, I think, mm -hmm. to uh, January mm -hmm. 3rd or Fourth. Um, hmm. It's between the hours of 9 a.m. on December 31st and 12.30 p.m. the following day, and then between 9 a.m. and 11 p.m. on the Saturday and Sunday before and after the 31st. Who's that? It's a very short, very short window. Yeah. What, what's that from? The state code. That's when they're, that's when they're selling them? That's for the allowed usage. <laughs> for individuals to shoot off fireworks. But they can the buy sale. it from the town. It's a sale. Wouldn't that be the sale? Because we define the usage, right? Right. They didn't define the use at all. Sale. Right. Oh, OK. Sorry. Kelly, what you read, is that our current? The, the say that again, Dave. Yeah, the sale, uh, according to the state code, is from December 10th uh, through January 3rd. And Kelly, what you were reading previously, is that what our current uh, ordinance is for New Year's? Or what was that that you were reading? Um, we'll just read it again. The sales is from December 10th through January 3rd, but the usage is 
9 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. on the following day from December 31st through New Year's Day, and then 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. on the Saturday and Sunday before and after December 31st. I think that may be, may be that's ours, is. isn't it? Can you, um, I don't know what that is. That's in December we're banned? We, we haven't even banned anything in December. 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 No, I thought we yeah. delayed December. Right I thought now, we delayed December. Right now in our state, in our city code, we have nothing outlining the usage right. for it. Yeah. Did I say that wrong? Sure. Can I have? Okay. <laughs> and that's, are you referring to the proposal? Yeah, the, I, I was just saying because the, uh, I thought the state, I thought the state right. indicated when they're selling fireworks, but they gave us the parameters to be able to, yeah, to fire them off. So the state also gives parameters for usage of fireworks, and right. the cities can go in and set whatever they want. Right. That. So, I have a question. So, what you just read from the state code, that's the time they can sell them or the time they can shoot them? The time that they can shoot them. Mm -hmm. And then we can pass whatever we choose. The time they can sell them is from the 10th of December the to, to the 3rd of January. But 24 hours a day, right? So, so they, Kelly, you're saying that they limited it for, for New Year's, but they didn't limit it for the use for July 4th. They did. They limited usage for July 4th as well. To what? I thought it was wide open and the city was supposed to decide it. The state outlined usages for both July and December. I was just reading December because that's coming up immediately. Um, but I can find July really quick as well. The state hadn't, hadn't met. Do you, do you have that code section right there? I thought they were out of Is session. Is it on top of that? Uh, uh, post, uh, yeah, post code post. section. Okay. Between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11 p.m. on July 4th and Saturdays and Sundays immediately preceding and following July 4th for the use. So, Kelly, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Please. Uh, so, just kind of not want to rehash all this. I think we've already been through this, but just backing up. This is really unfortunate that the state initiated this whole project, made money on it, didn't share the, the uh, you know the tax revenue with us. We have to then pay to police it. So I don't appreciate that. Um, and I have never got as many calls as I got on the firework program, uh, just in my uh, tenure here in the council. And so this is a very hard thing to police. Cedar Falls as well struggled with it. Um, and I think it's absolutely too hard to police, and we have to draw a line somewhere and understand that. But I think at this point, even having a small window just creates, as we have confusion right here, can you imagine the confusion out there? And I think it's just a simpler road to say in the city limits, we're simply not going to uh, shoot off fireworks. And I think that makes it easier for the police department to take care of the crime they have to already attend to without adding more on top to their plate. And then on top of that, we then as citizens have to pay for additional police resources to run around firework calls, which I recall there were hundreds of calls purely related to fireworks, which is something that we want to limit because we already have enough uh, work to do in that area. So I would caution us to go down this road. I think Cedar Falls was wise as they've almost got their um, policy set on this. And I think we should look at them, uh, give them a serious look. And um, just to add on to a, a point, we before used to be able, because Kelly and the staff used to, is it transient license, where yeah. we had to spend time doing, and now what changes has happened to that? Um, so for the summer round of fireworks sales, um, we determined that they would be considered transient merchants because they would be only be in operation for um, less than the state requirement for a business to be in operation and not be considered a transient merchant, which would be um, 60 days. So a lawsuit took place um, where some of the metro cities got sued 
and it was determined that cities cannot require any kind of license in addition to uh, the fireworks license, so we can no longer require a transient merchant license, which is unfortunate because that was a great revenue generator for the city clerk's office, so I'm a little upset, but we cannot require any kind of additional licensing, only the state license. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> well, to me, this is very incomplete, um, and there's two, two aspects of this. There's the sales of it, and then there's the, the use of it. And, you know, limiting it to this, um, as suggested in here, is one avenue that can be gone down. And I know that when I had a ward meeting that specified specifically this issue for probably two-thirds of that hour and a half, they came up with some suggestions. And it was very limited window, and their window that they had suggested was only two hours from 8 to 10 p.m. at that time. Um, but... Uh, I, I mean, so the, the sales part of it, to me, even though you're saying that about can't require licensing, I know that there was a lawsuit that was uh, started in Des Moines, a judge ruled that uh, we could restrict their use, and or not, not their use, we could restrict where they are sold. And I would like to see added to this a, a, a part, a section that says that these um, fireworks can only be sold in industrial, uh, industrially zoned areas of the, within the city limits of Waterloo. And that's not illegal. That can be done. We can restrict. We just can't keep them from, from being sold. Uh, and that's something that was suggested uh, in the ward meeting as well. The other thing I think that needs to be in here is there needs to be a posting in any place that does sell them that if, there, if we are going to allow use in a specified period of time, that that has to be posted so that everybody knows when they're buying this, these, um, uh, the fireworks, that what the, what's required of them as far as their usage within the city of Waterloo. Um, and I, I think there should be a legal limit to the age of the person who can buy and who can use and there needs to be a standard that uh, you can't be above the legal limit uh, of intoxication, and also that that we require, which I, my understanding is the legislature, there is money there that they're supposed to send back to the cities, but I think that we need to reinforce that by sending a letter to the legislature and to the governor saying that that we will uh, we are. Uh, demanding from the state legislature beings that you instituted this law that you reimburse us for the monetary compensation that uh, accrues from having to enforce this. So those are things I want to see added to to this ordinance. Mr. Yes, sir. I don't argue with anything you're saying, Mr. Morrissey, but I do think having heard from the law enforcement, all we've done now is load some more expectations on them that how they're going to determine whether or not a kid's 14 or 16 and we're going to start doing blood alcohol level tests i mean we're already saying they can't can't take care of what's going on so i don't think that's probably a, a viable suggestion but i guess what i'd like to what i'd like to suggest is some kind of a compromise i know uh on the public safety subcommittee i was outvoted because my other two members wanted to have a complete ban i'd like to see you know, Evansdale is doing uh, noon to midnight, December 31st, and then uh, 12.30 a.m. on the immediate follow Well, I'm sorry, from noon on New Year's Eve day to 12.30 a.m. So that basically gets your fireworks or New Year's Eve, and that's it. Then what I'd like to see is I'd like to see a committee formed between Waterloo, Cedar Falls, and Evansdale, and all come together and get this resolved because, again, Evansdale is out there doing something now different than Cedar Falls, and we're someplace in the middle. And I think all we're going to do is create chaos for all of our public safety group. And I'm not saying we've got the right answer, they've got the right answer, but I think this is one of these deals where we need to have a committee between the three communities and come to a resolution and everybody do the same thing. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, I equate this to, uh, to a speed limit. When people are in, are violating the speed limit, we raise the speed limit so that more people will be in compliant. And I think that's all we're doing here is that we're just giving them more days so that we're saying, well, now you're you're legal. I would be 
in favor of banning it like Cedar Falls is. Um, I think that that would discourage people from selling those here and hopefully reduce the compliance that the police officers will have to enforce. And, and I think one of the challenges we've had, we, we, we had a ban uh, in shooting them off up until June 30th to July 4th, but the challenges came before that because people weren't adhering to um, not firing them off within city limits. So um, we put out public service information. We went to Facebook. We did all those things to tell people exactly when you can and can't do them, and it was still um, confusion. I think Cedar Falls, uh, conversations with Mayor Brown, but Cedar Falls is is complete ban. Um, so, I mean, only one way to, to properly discourage folks from putting them in the correct places, they may not waste their time if there's a complete ban on them. So right now what we have um, is, uh, what is it, 6 to 10 p.m., and I'm not hearing any support from anyone about that. Um, I'm also don't think I'm getting a post for having five days again. I think whatever we decide has to be less than that, if I'm not mistaken. So um, do we, Mr. we have the Public Safety Committee who's already looked at this as well. What were you saying, Mr. Wilber? I, I, would, I would ask, we, we discussed the possibility of tabling this, and I think we need to do that so that we can talk amongst ourselves where we're at with this. Sounds like uh, two or three of us are for a total ban, where others may be more for a compromise. So uh, if that's the case, I would like to table this for about one week. Is that what you're work asking? Session. Right now we're at a work session, but we do have on the agenda Uh, 11 I, I think it goes back to what he stated before we got we're dealing with December right now mm -hmm. but I guess we in a couple days I thought in December one more thing while we're have a lull here you know I agree with the mayor that one way to clear up any confusion is it's just they're not legal. So that would clear that up. The other thing that we haven't mentioned that I, I am concerned about and would always take the side on is I did have quite a few veterans call with issues related to this. Um, and I just, it just kind of adds to the, adds to the mix, I guess. But there's a lot of folks that have problems um, with fireworks um, and some folks with PTSD and other issues related to the their service, uh, we do need to be mindful of those folks as well. So uh, something else for us to consider as we walk through this process. So, um, yes, ma'am. Um, but Dave and I consulted, and if there isn't support for the ordinance as it's proposed right now, one thing council could do is just fail it the whole way through and make some sort of motion on a recommendation to bring back a separate ordinance that would have um, different uses outlined in it, or we can just do a work session as well. But I think we have to move towards some sort of direction on what we want to decide to do with the approaching December usage period. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because what I'm hearing, we want to uh, make sure that they are able to sell in a particular place, that they have this signage put up, because there are some concerns about where they're actually um, locating these. I'm also hearing um, that there's never been this amount of service, I mean, calls to council members <laughs> with regards to fireworks as well. That's, I, I received a lot, and I assume uh, some of you has, uh, received a lot of calls about it as well. But um, if you want, uh, we're at your disposal. If you would um, like us at that time to come back with another proposal for you, I'll give um, Mayor Brown and Mayor, Mayor Foss a call if you want to, um, to see where they're at, which we know. But I can kind of figure out or find out why they made the determinations to do what they did and bring that information back to all of you. 
um, and then come back with another recommendation. But uh, we gotta we gotta make a decision at some point. But I, I know you want some firm information first. So are you <coughs> suggesting tabling it then, or what are you suggesting? I'm saying that we probably, I know for a fact, hearing everybody's conversation right now, no one is in favor of what's currently on the agenda. Right. So, Mr. Why Mayor, well, I'm in favor of parts of it. It's just other parts I'm not in favor of, and I think that there needs to be additional information tacked on to this ordinance. That's what I'm in favor of, and regardless, we, could, we could be here until 2 in the morning doing that. Well, but then you say vote this down. Right. Vote this down, and then we'll redo it. Yeah, yeah, could be. So we can do it, but but I'm but then but then all I'm saying, Councilman Schmidt, is that if we do that, what we may end up doing is sitting here doing the same thing in two weeks, you know, Cause, cause rather than hashing it all out because just certain people within the council are going to be privy to that information, and then we're going to have it presented to us uh, the Thursday before is brought to uh, our attention for a vote. Because what, what I'm hearing in your recommendations, Councilman, is you were, your recommendations were more so geared towards where they, the, the sale of fireworks versus the firing of fireworks. I think you gave about three or four or five different scenarios from the signs that are put up to industrial areas, which was more so more so geared to where they can sell them at as opposed to what I'm hearing about from all out ban to shortening those days. So, I mean, well, well we, Mr. Mayor, I, when I talked earlier, it was regarding both the sale and the use, uh, the application of this law when it comes down to usage of fireworks. And I just think that, that we need to get something decided on and voted on. That's all I'm saying. Be, so, I mean, it sat there long enough, and we've had long enough to look this over, talk to uh, our constituents and other people about this in order to come up with some consensus about what should be included in this ordinance. That's all I'm saying. So we have uh, number 11 coming up. Why don't we go ahead and vote on that? If that fails, shoot me the, the email with your suggestions. Um, I'll talk to Cedar Falls and Evansdale. Um, and we can have a, another work session next week um, and come with some information. And then from that work session, we can put something on the agenda the following week. Very good. Sure. Motion, right. motion for adjournment. Second. Motion to be made with second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Adjourn. Let's call our finance committee to order. Madam Clerk, would you read the roll, please? Mr. Jacobs? Here. Mr. Powers? Here. Mr. Welper? Here. Mr. Chairman, I move the approval of the agenda and approval of the minutes from November 6, 2017, as proposed. Second. We have a motion, a second in the agenda and minutes. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Someone would take the first two items under travel request. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll take Police Officer Gersh to attend a class on rifle instructor research. Destination is Johnston, Iowa. Dates November 15, 2017. Amount not to exceed $175. Number two, the refund requests the amount of $120.90. The property located at 504 Maryland Avenue for extended yard ways, fill, fees build in error. Second. The motion a second on the first two items. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign, those pass. pre -auths. Mr. Chairman, pre-authorizations to expend over $1,000. Building maintenance, $2,500. For roof repair at 1112 Sycamore Street, Leisure Services, $7,000 to purchase one Crown DCI 
1250 n two channel power amplifier and sound system reconfiguration at Young Arena. Leisure servers is eight thousand two hundred twenty five dollars to purchase a one hundred twenty gallon commercial water heater for Young Arena, uh, including installation. Police department seven thousand six hundred dollars. Replace exterior opening off the old paint room in the property evidence building with an overhead door. Sanitation, $3,109.30 for two cylinders and a switch pressure single pole 20 PSI for the vernier grinder at the yard waste site. Sewer department, $12,456.10 for a boiler heater timer multi-mill control to control three modulating boilers and lead leg operation with all electrical parts and labor. Sue department, $12,710.50 plus $250 shipping handling for two pH probes, three DO probes, one SCI 1500 controller, mobile sensor management, MSM service fee, MSM startup, other accessories and travel. And lastly, traffic operations, $2,801.04 for one Volmet Black Street light pole with arm, hand hole, T base, and connecting hardware. Okay, we have a motion and a second on all the pre auths. Any of those you have to question? You question? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. They pass. And the bills payment this month, we do not have any budget light item amendments. Bills payment, $3,402,364.09. Second. We have a motion and a second on the bills payment. Questions? If you're none, all in favor say aye. 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 Bills are paid. Mr. Chairman, I move for adjournment. Second. Motion and a second on adjournment. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Evening. Microphone is working tonight, huh? <laughs> all right. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please read the roll? Mr. Jacobs? Here. Mr. Morrissey? Here. Mr. Powers? Here. Mr. Lind? Mr. Amos? Here. Mr. Schmidt? Here. Mr. Welper? Here. All right. Thank you. Uh, now it's time to uh, honor our moment of silence. Uh, if you can stand or sit is your option, but please join us. All right, thank you. Uh, we have some very special guests today. Uh, we have Jim and Kelly Sullivan that will lead us. Also, Murray Davidson and Tom Davidson as well. So if you would please come to the um, right there and lead us in the pledge, that would be great. Come on, get that mic set up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Supposed to be Bluetooth anyway. <laughs> and and uh, we'll have um, we also have a presentation by the Sullivans as well. So we we have more in store. So we're looking forward to it. So. Hi. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
right, thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. And under uh, public hearing item number two, um, it's amended to correct the contractor's name and dollar amount by adding Woodruff Construction, LLC of Waterloo, Iowa, in the amount of $65,522. And then we're also going to add item number 13, resolution affirming support of the Federal Historic Tax Credit Program. Second. And also the approval of minutes of November 6, 2017, regular session as proposed. Second. That motion has been made with a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We have an agenda. Uh, first item on the agenda is a proclamation uh, declaring November 13th through the 19th, 2017 as Registered Apprenticeship Appreciation and, and Awareness Week. So I'd like to call up. Rhonda Hall from Iowa at Works. It's a long walk, wasn't it? <laughs> hey, Rhonda, nice to see you. All right, uh, City of Waterloo, Iowa proclamation. Whereas we recognize the economy, the economy demands, we recognize the economy demands of future ready Iowa with post-secondary education credentials and the ability to respond immediately to changing economic and business needs. And whereas registered apprenticeship is a vital component of talent development strategies in many high demand and high growth sectors and is recognized as a critical post-secondary education training and employment option. And whereas registered apprenticeship programs enhance the economic vitality and lead to a stronger economic environment by producing highly skilled and competitive workers and provides Iowa workers with portable skills and credentials recognized nationally. And whereas the city of Waterloo recognizes the strength and leadership which results from our federal and state partnerships and our sponsors of registered apprenticeship programs. And whereas the Iowa Apprenticeship and Job Training Act was signed into law and aims to help training, train, help training of workers to fill career skilled jobs without having to take on student loan debt. Now I therefore, Quentin Hart, Mayor of the City of Waterloo, do hereby proclaim November 13th through the 19th as Registered Apprenticeship Appreciation and Awareness Week. So big day and big deal. So Rhonda, tell us more about it. Well, you may not know, but Iowa is actually a national leader for offering registered apprenticeships opportunities. And as of November 2nd, Iowa has 846 active registered apprenticeship programs and 8,720 registered apprentices. So uh, we do lead the nation um, in that area. So we're wanting to continue to grow those numbers also. And so at Iowa Works, what we're trying to do is help employers um, become more knowledgeable about the uh, advantages of having a registered apprenticeship program and help them start registered apprenticeship programs with their businesses, as well as um, letting job seekers know the opportunities that are available to them. And so if you are a business or a job seeker and you're interested in learning more about registered apprenticeships, certainly come to our office. We'll be happy to visit with you and help you uh, learn more about that and, and how it can help you with your uh, business as well as uh, opportunities for work in the future. Rhonda, we thank you. We thank uh, Iowa at Works for all your efforts to make sure we have a prepared and educated workforce to take over uh, a lot of those jobs that are coming to our community. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Now I would like to call up uh, Kelly Sullivan, Jim Sullivan, Murray Davidson, and Tom Davidson. Again, to you. you too. You you too. I, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
All right, City of Waterloo, Iowa Proclamation. Whereas the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, prompted an immediate action response to volunteers in the military, and whereas over 16 million American men and women served and some 419,400 died during the combat period, and whereas the five Sullivan brothers of Waterloo volunteered in the U.S. Navy to serve the nation in 1941, and whereas on November 13, 1942, their ship, the USS Juno, was destroyed by a Japanese submarine in the South Pacific, killing 690 sailors, including the Sullivan brothers. And whereas this was the greatest single combat loss experienced by any family in American history. Therefore, we commemorate November 13, 2017, as the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of the loss of Waterloo's five Sullivan brothers, representative of their service and sacrifice of all 8,398 Iowans who perished during World War II. In witness thereof, I have hereunto subscribed my name and the seal of the city of Waterloo to be affixed this 13th day of November of 2017. So, Kelly, tell, tell us a little bit about what's happening. Well, thank you, Mayor Hart and City Council for, for this proclamation and for honoring the Sullivans. Uh, November 13th has always been a bittersweet day for our family. It's, right, it's very close to Veterans Day, so November 11th we honor our veterans, and on November 13th we honor the over 700 sailors who were killed on USS Juno. So I, I thank the city of Waterloo for all that you do to continue to honor not just the Sullivans, but all veterans. We do a great job in this community of, of honoring all our, our veterans. And I invite all of you to come out to the Sullivan Brothers Iowa Veterans Museum this Saturday, 1 o'clock. We're going to have a, a wonderful re reception and um, honor the, the anniversary, the 75th anniversary. And one of my former captains of USS the Sullivans, Admiral Rich Brown, is coming here all the way from Washington, D.C. to be the speaker. So it'd be great to have some people from Waterloo come to this event. And, um, and work. Right. I just got back from New York yesterday and uh, ha had a wonderful port visit with the Navy's finest ship, USS the Sullivans, DDG-68. Way City was also with us, another great Navy ship, and we had a great weekend, and the sailors were able to march in the Veterans Day Parade down Manhattan, so it was, it was goosebumps watching them and getting to be with them as we marched down uh, the streets of Manhattan. It was a wonderful weekend. Very proud moment. All right. Thank you. All right, and we are absolutely proud, and we, we thank you and your family for your sacrifices and contributions, and our, our council, I think we have more than a quorum of our council members that are served in the military as well. So we want to thank you so much and appreciate all that you've done to keep the memories of live as well and, and for the many great things that your family has done for this community. Well, let's have those council members stand and let's give them please, a round of applause. Please, please stand. Anyone here that's, anyone that's here, you know, we're all having this. Thank you, and Councilman Lynn, in his absence, is a veteran as well. Uh, where is, is Mike in the audience right now? So Mike, you want to come up here for a quick second? I think we have just a small presentation to make, if I'm not mistaken. Full of surprises tonight, huh? <laughs> How are you, good sir? Good evening, sir. All right, all right. It's all yours. Well, I don't know where they're at. So, I'm a um, honorary member of the USS the Sullivan's DDG 68, uh, DDG uh, DD 537, DDG 68 uh, Reunion Association, and. Uh, our members would like to present to Kelly as a token of our appreciation for all that she does for the Sullivan ships and uh, the Sullivan family. We'd like to present Kelly to this uh, 
bouquet of flowers. Hopefully, uh, they'll stay green for quite a while. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All the members of the association are very proud of you and all you do. So uh, that's our token of uh, appreciation for all that. So thank you. That was beautiful. All right, thank you. And on the card, it says, we stick together. That's a great symbolism. I love it. Five red roses and 13. Oh. Uh, I, uh, bells of Ireland. So. They're, what, they're called what? Bells Bell, of Ireland. Bells these. of Ireland. Isn't yeah. that perfect? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The so. bells of Ireland. Did you come up with all these great ideas, Mike? No. I... <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Indeed, he did come up. I love that. I've yeah. never seen bells of Ireland before. So. These are beautiful. Thank you. I love them. Billy, can you get a picture with them? Please. We can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is also oral presentations. Uh, for those of you that would like to address uh, non-agenda related items, if you would please step up to the microphone. Hi, Mayor. Hi, Council. Good, good evening, Jim Chapman, sir. 224 Birch. First of all, I want to congratulate all the candidates that ran in the election, the ones that won and the ones that didn't. Everybody can hold their head up high, I think. So, But there was a comment in uh, the opinion paper the other day that caught my eye. Uh, Councilman certainly seems to have more in common with the mayor than uh, the loser. And that kind of caught my eye. I think that uh, the council people that ran and won should have probably more in common with their constituents and the people that voted for them and the items that uh, they ran on, such as uh, the taxes, growing Waterloo. It almost sounded like we were teaming up here to have a football game. I, you know, <laughs> It, that article caught me, and I just had to bring it to your attention that uh, I, I think they ought to uh, concentrate on the issues, not who they're in line with and who they ain't in line with. And let's get on with business. Did somebody, you, did somebody say that, or what's what's? It was in I the didn't paper. Even read that. It was somebody. in the opinion paper yesterday. Oh. All right. Thank you, sir. Yep. <clears throat> Good evening. Don Share, 1415 Downing Avenue. Uh, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Northeast Iowa Food Bank. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being affiliated with them for the last couple of years, helping out where I can. And it was brought to my attention that this year uh, they would like to provide around 2,000 Thanksgiving meals uh, for folks that don't have enough to eat. Now, they have enough meat. They have, uh, the number I was given was around 2,000 hams. What they don't have is the sides. Uh, they need instant mashed potatoes, box stuffing, canned vegetables, canned fruit, and some type of a box dessert such as a cake or brownies. Uh, they are trying to get this in by Friday if possible so that they can box everything up for distribution next week. Um... I took a few things in this morning, and while I was there, there were a bunch of high school kids from the Cedar Valley there, and they had done a can drive. And there was 104 high schoolers from all different schools around the Cedar Valley. 
And then judging from what they brought in uh, versus what I brought in, uh, they had to bring in thousands of pounds of canned goods. They really did a good job. Uh, pick up truck loads, uh, trunk loads of cars, back seats of cars filled up. And uh, I was real proud of them. They were nice kids. I talked to them for a while. Uh, but we have people in, the, in our community that need help, and I'm just asking everybody to help. And if uh, uh, Barbara Mike at the Northeast Iowa Food Bank, the number is 319-235-0507. Or you can go to their website at www.northeastiowa, all spelled out, foodbank.org. And anything anybody can do to help would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? Yes, sir. Lawrence Wheeler, 433 Brat Nover. Seems to be there's a problem that I had seen uh, pop up on the internet, and I kind of hope the city of Waterloo can uh, do something about this, and people need to take the necessary precautions to protect their property. And I was kind of hoping you guys would adopt an ordinance to keep felons from um, having possession of Coros power tools but I found out that that's not exactly constitutionally legal because what they're doing is they're getting these portable grinders and drills and modifying them, putting uh, what is called an aluminum oxide cutting blade on it. And this ha has been happening in Chicago, Detroit, Boston, a lot of the big cities back in the East Coast. And what they're doing to burglarize homes as they're cutting, using these tools to uh, break into houses and businesses. And people need to be made aware of this new uh, crime problem that is going on outside of our community. And uh, also too, I'd like to see a, a faster response uh, by our police department. So if any of these type burglars by happen by chance to uh, cut into a system where a automatic alarm is activated, like ADT vent, et cetera, that, uh, the, that the police respond in a, in a really quicker response time because it takes about an, uh, an hour for them to respond, to have it all go through dispatch and, and, and go through the chain. And it's before it gets really bad here in Waterloo, uh, I like to s see something done to enhance our community and say, hey, we don't want this and crime going on in our community. All right, all right. Also, too, February is coming up. And I don't understand why, if we got uh, people of African-American heritage that we don't acknowledge Black History Month, they some people are now calling it a racist holiday along with the uh, Confederate flag, and that's, that's not what the intent of it. And also, too, I don't understand why they only recognize Dr. King, but also, too, on the 23rd of February is the um, usual anniversary date of the assassination of Malcolm X. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to um, share their thoughts with the council? Ouch. David Dreyer, 3145 West 4th Street. Um, last week I asked about the status of the Lafayette School and the Rath Packing, and uh, I was advised to inform the community this week because it wasn't addressed by the council or the mayor last week. Um, the former Lafayette School is, the city is working on a contract for both Mr. Roof and Mr. Ellis, both parties to the original agreement, to see how they wish to move forward. 
The deadlines are passed for some actions on the development agreement. We would like to discuss their future plans for infield development in locations in the community. As you may recall, which I do not, the agreement contains several sites and they have made infrastructure improvements and building some homes on other sites. Mr. Ellis has some family medical difficulties, so that has now slowed to a response to our meeting request. Um, my thought on that particular point is that don't tie anything to anything. Each one stands on its own and it's individually prosecutable or whatever to get them back. Don't tie a bunch of properties together in future agreements. Um, the, uh, our, our city lawyer did talk to me after the meeting, again, not informing the public, and that's why I'm up here taking my time this time. Uh, the former Rath administration building, the city has sent legal notice to the current developer that he is in default to the city development and that we need to respond, that he needs to deed the land back to the city of Waterloo. He has failed to respond. We have initiated a 657A action to regain the property and that process should be nearing completion in late 2017, early 17. Um, the other response I got from Noel on that was that we're, we're doing this at the least cost necessary for the city. If it was in the original agreements that it automatically comes back after a certain period of time, we wouldn't be in legal action for any amount of money. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? <clears throat> Going a second time. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I just wanted to bring up again and remind people that this Friday is Adoption Friday. That's November 17th and starts at 1230 over at Blackhawk County Courthouse. And then we have an, uh, some court hearings that day involving adoptions and I Hope that as many people as possible can get over there to support that. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to correct something that was said during open comments. Um, I highly object to the fact that it takes an hour for our police department to respond to a call. We have a top-notch police department in this city, and if you don't believe it, go do some ride-alongs uh, with those officers. Um, very efficient, very professional, getting better all the time. And so for anyone to say that, really, they are not obviously not informed or whatever the case may be, but I want to say hats off to our police department because I've, I've heard nothing but great things um, as, as we are improving every single day. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, other comments, council? Motion received, file oral comments. Second. Motion has been made with the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. That's items 1A through 2G. And within that are the bills payment. The bills payment are three million four hundred and two thousand three hundred and sixty-four dollars and nine cents. That's three comma four zero two comma three six four point zero nine. Second. That motion has been made with the second. Um, questions, Council? All right, Madam Clerk. Mr. Jacobs. Yes. Mr. Mr. Morrissey. Yes. Mr. Powers. Yes. Mr. Lind. Mr. Amos? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. All right, those items carry. What? Mr. Mayor, are we ready for number two? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to receive and file proof of publication of notice of public hearing, and that's for the hangar number four rehabilitation project at the Waterloo Regional Airport via IDOT project number 9-1-180 dash ALO dash 200 and IDOT contract number 19559. Second. second. That motion has been made with the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The hearing is now open. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this particular item on the agenda? Going a second time. Mr. Mayor, make a motion to close the hearing. Second. That motion has been made with the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The hearing is now closed. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to adopt a resolution confirming approval of specifications, form of contract, etc. Second. The motion has been made with the second. Council questions? Madam Clerk. 
Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Powers? Yes. Mr. Amos? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. All right, that item carries. Mr. Schmidt, I'd like to adopt a resolution authorizing to proceed. Second. That motion has been made with the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion to receive. Oh, sorry. And we, uh, everyone was unanimous. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to receive and file and instruct the city clerk to read well, bids. I thought we just did the motion to receive and file and instruct. Did we not? No, we just authorized to proceed. Oh, okay. I thought that was a resolution. That was you a resolution. Were, you were right, and I was wrong. No. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> no. mark that in the minute. No way. Don't you write that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so before we complete that one, I need to do a roll call vote. Mm-hmm. A uh, roll call vote for the uh, authorization to proceed. Mr. Powers? Yes. Mr. Amos? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Wilper? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Keith sweating bullets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. I'll make a motion to receive and file and instruct the city clerk to read bids. Second. The motion has been made with the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Madam Clerk? Our estimate was $69,750. The first bidder was Failer Hurley Construction of Waterloo, Iowa. They provided 5% security. Their bid amount was $73,220. Second bidder was Cardinal Construction Incorporated of Waterloo, Iowa. They provided 5% security. Their bid amount was $84,552. The third bidder was Woodruff Construction LLC of Waterloo, Iowa. They provided 5% security. Their bid amount was $65,522. All right, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to adopt a resolution awarding the bid to Woodruff Construction, LLC of Waterloo, Iowa for hangar number four, rehabilitation project at the Waterloo Regional Airport via IDOT project number 9-1-180-ALO-200 and IDOT contract number 19-559 in the amount of $65,522 and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute said document. Second. A motion has been made with the second, Madam Clerk. Mr. Amos? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. Mr. Powers? Yes. All right, that item carries. Could someone take uh, three and four, please? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Morris. I'd like to make a motion to, uh, I'd like to make a motion approving change order number five, the final quantity summary for a net decrease of $62,838.39 for the fiscal year 2017 bridge deck repair and overlay program contract number 879 and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute said document. And next, adopt a resolution approving completion of project and recommendation of acceptance of work for work performed by Boulder Contracting LLC of Grundy Center, Iowa at a total cost of $1,382,794.18 in conjunction with the fiscal year 2017 bridge deck and overlay program contract number 879 and receive and file two-year maintenance bond. Second. second. That motion has been made with the second. Council, any more questions? Madam Clerk. M Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I just, uh, is it, um, uh, gonna, is it usual practice to have uh, that at the end, the two-year maintenance bond on projects like this? Uh, Eric? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <clears throat> Eric Thorson, yes, that's required by state code. So most of our large construction projects have those bonds. Okay, All thanks, right. Eric. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Powers? Yes. Mr. Amos? Yes. You got everybody? Yeah. Everybody answer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, five, six, and seven, someone. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Welper. Number five is a resolution approving professional service agreement with NutriJet Systems, Inc. of Hudson, Iowa, in the amount not to exceed $36,140 for biosolids removal services and authorize the mayor to execute said document. Number six is a resolution approving professional service supplemental agreement. Number three, with AECOM Technical Services, Inc. of Waterloo, Iowa, in the amount not to exceed $9,230 in conjunction with the fiscal year 2016 Shawless Road Trail Extension, Phase 1, contract number 858, and authorize the mayor to execute said document. 
Number seven is a resolution approving professional service supplemental agreement number one with Amit Design of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, an amount not to exceed $6,715 in conjunction with the fiscal year 2018 Ainsboro Avenue improvements, contract number 942, and authorize the mayor to execute said document. Second. The motion has been made with a second. Question, sir. David Dreyer, 3145 West 4th Street. Since I live on Ainsboro, I'd like an explanation on number seven. And while I'm up here, rather than have stand up again, I want an explanation on number eight also. All right, so. I know that's not come up yet. But I'll make sure we take care of it for you. Um, could uh, we get an explanation for um, number seven to Ainsboro Avenue? Uh, Eric Thorson, city engineer. Uh, there's a development agreement uh, some time ago that the council approved with VGM, and it requires a trail on the north side of San Marnin. And uh, so we're asking a consultant to include that in this contract with the Ainsboro improvements. So this is the extra work that they had to do for survey and design and um, to put that into that project was something we have to do by that development agreement. And we felt it was best to include it in this contract and hopefully get better prices bid with larger works. All right, thank you. Council, any questions? Madam Clerk. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Powers? Uh, yes. Mr. Amos? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. All right, thank you. Eight and nine, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Schmidt. Item number eight is adopting a resolution approving an amendment to the development agreement with BCS Properties LLC in the city of Waterloo to add additional land into the development agreement area and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute said documents. Item number nine is adopting a resolution approving a professional services agreement with HR Green Inc. of Cedar Rapids, Iowa in the amount of $364,200 in conjunction with implementation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency Community-Wide Brownfield Hazardous Substance Assessment Grant and authorize the mayor to execute said agreement. Second. second. That motion has been made with a second. No, could you... Re just an overview of number eight, please. Noel Anderson, Community Planning Development Director. As you may recall, we uh, approved development agreement with BCS Properties, which is Brent Dahlstrom and George Cooley, previously for land located at the northeast corner of 63 and West Ridgeway. At that time, they did not own the full corner site. Um, they have now acquired that property and are asking that the development agreement be extended to include that corner site property. Um, this is a development agreement that was approved for 15 years at 95% tax rebates to help push forward the development of the area. This is the former Hanson dump site, so they have a lot of unknowns underground um, for great amounts of chunks of concrete, um, garbage. Um, a lot of things are, were dumped into this area in the past prior to the city having um, ordinances and laws in place for dumping in the city limits. As you may recall from the original development agreement, um, the preliminary cost estimates for the extra costs of groundwork are guesstimated at 350 to 400,000 based on soil borings and all that that they had Terracon do. Um, so the tax rebate schedule was set up to help for move forward for development of the site. Just as a note, uh, this site is still projected to pay over 28,000 in taxes to the city under the first few projects and over 678,000 over that 15 year period. As an example of a point of reference, a $270,000 house in Waterloo would pay about $5,910 in taxes. So these projects, even with the tax rebates from day one, will still pay over 4.7 times that amount. All right, somebody's done their homework. Thank you. Uh, questions, Council? Madam Clerk? Mr. Yes, sir. Um, with number nine, the, I, I had talked to uh, Eric Schrader earlier today, and uh, I don't know, Noel, if um, you'd talk to Eric about this, but uh, in the explanation of this, it talked about the um, Broadway corridor and other places where where this might be used. Is that is that still there? That this this has designated areas that this uh, is going to be used for, or is it just sort of wide open? <coughs> Noel Anderson, Community Planning Development Director. So this is a citywide assessment grant, so we are able to use it. Um, as projects move ahead. 
um, for the focus of applying for the grant, we did have to specify some areas. We specified, I believe, the Broadway corridor and the 63 corridor to specifically look at redevelopment efforts on there. But as, as opportunities arise in other parts of the community, we will be able to use the assessment grant on there as well to help move ahead for um, development of projects. And Mr. Mayor, uh, Noel, are there specific places on in the Broadway corridor where this is going to be used? I mean, do you have specific places in mind? That we, we do have some places in mind. We also have about three or four projects we're working on, um, and those will be coming to light as we move forward with them at this point. We'd like to keep those uh, confidential as we move ahead with the projects, but they will come back to council for approval. Okay. And then finally, $364,000, if I read that right, there's two $200,000 grants that this, where this money comes from? Correct. There's hazard base and then there's petroleum base, and we have to keep we have to separate out the two based on on the types of contaminants that we're concerned about being at the sites. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, Madam Clerk? <coughs> yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Sir, sorry. sorry. <coughs> Todd Obadal, 124 Amity Drive, on uh, item number eight. Um, this is more than just uh, amending a development agreement. It's uh, handing over another parcel of land. It's another sale of land. Um, and the estimation on the value of that land is approximately doubling uh, what the original resolution is. Um, I believe that uh, this process for uh, disposing of the city-owned land should go through the full process and not simply be part of an amendment to a development agreement uh, to make sure that the citizens of Waterloo get uh, fair market value for this property, that, uh, that we just give away the property to somebody who happens to have the property next door without going through the bidding process um, isn't the way to make sure that the citizens do get fair market value for what they own. Thank you. All right, your comments. Um, yeah, and also if you can, we have an idea of what this project will be as well after you explain the, the legal part, part of it. This is not city owned land, so this is privately owned land that they have acquired and we are merely extending the incentive package onto this land so it has no sale of property processed through the city of Waterloo at all. all right. What else do you, you wanted more Are explanation you of? Are able to talk about what it's going to be? Or? Not on this parcel yet, no. Okay, all right, thank you, sir. Any other questions? Madam Clerk? Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Powers? Yes. Mr. Amos? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Wilper? Yes. All right, that item carries. Number 10, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Amos. I'd like to make a motion to receive, file, and consider and pass for the second time an ordinance amending ordinance number 5079 as amended City of Waterloo zoning ordinance by amending section 10-3-1 definition of impound yard and recycling junk or salvage yards and section 10-27 dash one H parentheses eight parentheses special permit regulations for recycling junk and salvage yards and other miscellaneous updates. Second. All right, that motion has been made with the second uh, questions, comments. We picked this, we had this last week. Madam Clerk. Mr. Morrissey. Yes. Mr. Powers. Yes. Mr. Amos. Yes. Mr. Schmidt. Yes. Mr. Welper. Yes. Mr. Jacobs. Yes. <laughs> All right, that item carries. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules. Second. A motion has been made with the second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Powers. Yes. Mr. Amos. Yes. Mr. Schmidt. No. Mr. Welper. Yes. Mr. Jacobs. No. Mr. Morrissey. No. All right, thank you. They'll pick that up again next week. Uh, number 11. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Morrissey. I'd like to make a motion to receive, file, consider, and pass for the first time an ordinance amending the City of Waterloo Code of Ordinances by adding a new Title V, Chapter 2, Section 13 dash fireworks. Second. That motion has been made with the second. Um, comments? Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Goings, 1203 West 2nd Street. I think uh, everybody knows my background, and I'd like to add to the work session discussion. Uh, I originally called for a total ban, and then after thinking about it, um, I went to uh, limited time because that way then also the police department can funnel people into that time, and uh, that, that gives people a chance because they're going to light them off anyway. And also, um, Mr. Morrissey has said it three times about uh, restricting to residential or to industrial areas. And I think that's a good idea because that way at 11 o'clock at night, 
two guys can't say, oh, let's go get some fireworks and go get them and start lighting them off at that time. Thank you. All right. And uh, just for the record, we had a, a work session a little bit earlier to talk about this item. Um, we are, uh, to our neighbors, uh, Cedar Falls has had their first reading for a complete ban. Um, Evansdale is a modified time frame, if I'm not mistaken. So the conversation was to go out, um, talk to those cities again, do a little bit more research, add some of the comments we heard this evening, and then bring another draft. Uh, we'll discuss another draft next week, and then the following week uh, we'll bring um, something to you. So um, this vote, um, didn't hear much support for it earlier, but I did hear more conversation. So uh, if, without any other questions, we'll go ahead and take a vote. Mr. Amos? No. Mr. Schmidt? No. Mr. Welper? No. Mr. Jacobs? No. Mr. Morrissey? No. Mr. Powers? No. All right, we'll get back to the drawing board. Someone take number uh, 12 and 13. Anybody? Somebody? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Morrissey. I'd like to make a motion approving change order number three for a net increase of $57,446.90 and change order number four for a net increase of $34,291.32 for the fiscal year 2017 street reconstruction program contract number 921 and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute said documents. And number 13 is a resolution of forming affirming support of the federal historic tax credit program you want me to read the whole resolution we, we may Mayor? have mr deeds come up and give us a small summary about the impact and the importance <laughs> and what that means to the overall community so do you mean the second or? yeah you, you so i was second, answering your question second. so that motion has been made with the second mr deeds could you come up and tell us about 13 and if anyone else have any questions feel free to come on up Uh, David Deeds, 922 Mulberry Street. Uh, we asked for your consideration of this res or this affirmation of support for the historic tax credit program. Uh, because follow it, let me back up a little bit. As many of you are aware, uh, the U.S. Congress is in the process of uh, revising the U.S. tax code or proposing to revise the tax code. Uh, under the current U.S. House proposal, uh, they would eliminate the federal historic tax credit program and the current Senate proposal would scale it back to 10% and eliminate a, a second 10% uh, credit. Uh, the reason we ask you for this is other cities across the state have passed this resolution. In fact, this resolution is largely based off of one passed by Dubuque in October. Uh, Sioux City has passed one back in October. Burlington passed one as well. Uh, and, and I'm sure there are others, but those are some that come to the top of mind. Uh, the federal historic tax credit is important to our city for a number of reasons, uh, the not the least of which is the fact that you can look around our city and see the progress that's been made because of the federal historic tax credit, as well as the state historic tax credit. Uh, the, what I just passed around to you is uh, essentially uh, 32 reasons, which are 32 different buildings around the state, or I'm sorry, around the city of Waterloo that have been rehabilitated because of the federal historic tax credit and the state historic tax credit. Uh, not only do we get buildings that are revitalized, we get to reuse infrastructure uh, because these buildings are lo located in older parts of our cities, our city, uh, but we also create jobs with these. Uh, if you look down even just down that list, there's KWWL first off the list, which is 75 jobs that stayed in Waterloo rather than go to Cedar Falls Industrial Park. Uh, you look at number two, the single speed project, there's another 95 jobs, 72 FTEs. Uh, you look at the courtyard by Marriott, there's 150 jobs. So not only do we save buildings from the landfill, not only do we save our common story, but we also create jobs with this uh, historic tax credit. Um, <clears throat> the other reason is you might say, well, these, these are already done, right? But there are a lot more to do. If you look around the city of Waterloo at this point, there are dozens, if not hundreds of other buildings that need some sort of rehabilitation that the historic, uh, either state, federal, or both. Uh, will make possible, and without these, uh, many of these projects wouldn't have happened, and future ones won't happen uh, without the continuation of this federal historic tax credit. One other thing I would throw out there is for those that are concerned about the cost, um, 
Uh, Rutgers did a study where a dollar and 20 cents uh, comes back to the uh, federal government for every dollar that they invest. Another fact is that for every dollar of historic tax credits, there's four dollars of private investment in these projects. So there's a great multiplier effect. There's job creation. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to continue this program. And if you take a look at the state, I think there's been over 257 different um, projects. We're talking about over a billion dollars worth of economic impact. And uh, this is being watched so highly. Um, I had an opportunity last Friday to be on headline news to talk about the impacts that it will have to our local community. So it's a program we absolutely need to, to keep. Uh, Dubuque, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, the city of Waterloo, the city of Des Moines, um, have really been able to do some progressive things to change our main streets and some of our communities that have been hit uh, that need a little bit of uh, stimulation in those areas. So absolutely important, important program. We've got some great momentum. It'd be a shame to waste that momentum. So we'd like to keep it going. And I think there's currently, what you said, about 10 to 12 projects uh, that are pending there, right now. There are at and, least 10 in Waterloo that I'm aware of, and I'm not aware yeah. of all the projects that are pending. So, yeah. yep. All right. Uh, any other questions on 12 or 13? Oh, yeah. Me again. No. David Dreyer, 3145 West 4th Street. <laughs> uh, a little explanation on uh, number 12. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I forgot to ask myself. Thank you. Great, Thorstein. These are actually uh, two extra work orders. Um, the first one for $57,446.80 is to uh, pave the area where the uh, dental lab is being demolished. Um, that way we can stripe that for additional paving, or additional parking, excuse me. Uh, we're also going to restripe the parking lot around that that surrounds it to provide additional parking. The total would be about 67 additional stalls. Unfortunately, the weather's getting colder sooner than we had hoped, and the asphalt plant may close Friday. So the dental lab is not down yet, so this may or may not happen. We'll see what happens here. We're trying to make it happen yet this week, but I'm not sure that it actually will. Uh, the other one is extra work. The city and the railroad and the DLT participated in rebuilding the railroad crossing on East 4th Street and also on Nevada Street. Uh, the city also has to provide the um, asphalt um, run-ups, the approaches to those railroad crossings to make them smooth, and so we added this work onto the overlay project, and so that's the additional work for that, the 34,291.32. Erica, quick question. So... Uh, given that the cost of business um, goes up for these types of projects, are these is that price for the striping and the dental lab locked in? in um, case it, we'll, it we'll kind of have to check. Um, obviously, if we can't get it done this year, um, we'd go into spring. And I, I think if if the dental lab can get down, um, we can probably put recycled asphalt in there and at least have some parking. It just won't be very organized if we can't stripe it. <laughs> I just but want to we make... were really also hoping to restripe the larger lot and gain some more stalls too. It's just unfortunately the weather and uh, just end of season isn't really cooperating as much as we had hoped. So yeah, I just want to lock in the price so that next year if we don't get it, it we won't can check. Up, but so. I know that is a subcontractor to the prime on this job, so we'd have to check that out and see if they'd be willing to honor that next year or not. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding number thirteen. Um, if this is approved by council, where will it, where will it go? I mean, what will happen with this resolution? Well, we will um, send this to our um, legislators in Washington D.C. Um, and send out information, send the actual interview, but try to let them know how important this is. So it's going to go there to our leadership. Are these votes coming up? <coughs> uh, when is? Very soon. I think the, the House passed a total elimination of the program. Uh, um, well, they, yeah. And then uh, the, the Senate, what is it, 10 percent, which. Uh, on the Congress, but uh, I, I know it did get passed in committee in the House uh, just late last week. Uh, and uh, they hope to have something out of the U.S. House uh, by, the, by Thanksgiving, I think, is their goal. Uh, the Senate plan, which did keep 10 percent tax credit rather than the, the original 20 percent, uh, was in their uh, outline of plan or their plan that they released last Thursday. So uh, there's, uh, it's very timely and very necessary that we move quickly on this. And what does the 10 percent do? 
Well, I certainly, as I think we all know, 10% is better than zero, but uh, certainly uh, a lot of, uh, if you look even like at our project in Walnut, uh, the Walnut neighborhood, the rehabilitation of those houses, uh, that's, that was all uh, pro formed out based, based on the 20%. Uh, and, you know, say 10% doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, on a single house, you're talking 30, 30 to $40,000. That's pretty significant. All right. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. If I could add to that, I talked to uh, Legislative Director for Congressman Blom today. Congressman Blom has and got signatures from all members of Congress, uh, the con congressional members, uh, and a letter signed by all of them sending to Senator Grassley, Senator Ernst, and Senator Hatch, who was chairman of the Finance Committee, in support of maintaining the 20. Um, and so this would be, I think, significant for us to send that to them. And I think Congressman Blum would like that support uh, showing that what he's doing to help move this forward in the Senate uh, would be significant. So I think uh, they just got the signatures at two o'clock this afternoon and I've got all the information here if anybody wants it in terms of the signatures and what their language looks like. All right, we'll get it out as soon as it's approved. All right, Madam Clerk. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Wilper? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Morsey? Yes. Mr. Powers? Yes. Mr. Amos? Yes. All right, thank you. Number 14. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Make a motion to adjourn to executive session. Second. second. A motion has been made with a second. Uh, Mr. Zellifer. Dave Zellifer, city attorney for Waterloo, and I've reviewed uh, the reasons we're going back, and they do comply pursuant to section 21.5J. So we are within our means to do so. All right, Madam Clerk. Mr. Wilper? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Powers? Yeah. Mr. Amos? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. All right, let's go executive session. <coughs> if we can